Hey guys, it's Woody the Unexceptional Gamer, and this is Mail Monday, a weekly series where I take a look at the messages you send me and offer my feedback. So let's get this started. I'm not your typical viewer. I'm 21 years old living in the UK. I recently got made redundant from a job which I loved. I had a great sense of pride in the job I had, the results I achieved, but like I say, the company went bust. I have, however, found a job which is in a totally different sector of work. It does still pay my bills, but I'm finding it really hard to find that same sense of pride. There isn't a lot of jobs around where I live. Do I stick with this job, try and ask for a pay raise and stick with it, like I'm being told to do, or do I put all my efforts into trying to find a job that, like I used to have? So first, a quick explanation for my American viewers. Um, being made redundant is what we would call getting laid off. It's when your company lets you go, or I'll say fires you, but not because of your performance, because uh, they could no longer keep you on. You know, They would have kept you on if the company was healthy, but um, you know, they, they couldn't. They, they had to reduce staff, and sometimes it has nothing to do with your own performance. It has to do with how many people they have with your same skill set, or whether or not they want to stay you know, in that little sector that, that you worked on. But uh, So anyway, this poor fellow lost his job. Job, uh, not because you know any kind of bad behavior or bad performance, but because uh, the company wasn't doing well enough to keep him on. On to the advice section. Here's the deal: all jobs suck. <laughs> That's been my experience, and uh, I've said some of this before, so forgive me for for those of you who watch every single one of my videos. But um, when I was a computer programmer, when I first started this job. I loved it. Loved it more than, than you can imagine. It was a dream for me. I couldn't believe that people paid me to work on computers because it was such a passion. I would wake up at 6 a.m., teach myself how to code, and in this case it was C++, and then um, I would go to work and I would code all day, then I would come home at nights and, and I would watch videotapes or, or YouTube, not YouTube, but um, uh, online videos about how to code in, in object-oriented programming and things like that. It, it consumed every bit of me. But, um, you know, enough time goes by and suddenly it goes from your passion to your job. You know, something that you know how to do, something that you do well. But it's not as if every minute of every day is consumed by this, like, oh my gosh, I, I thirst to, to know more and more and more and more. And I think that's fairly natural with a job. I have a friend who, um, and what he does is he builds flight simulators for the Navy. And when he first got that job, it was incredible. And then they sent him to test pilot school, which you would think would, you know, gosh, it's one of the coolest things that can possibly happen in a job, right? And, you know, he would go up there, he'd take helicopters, and he'd see the, the, the roof of his house and wave to his wife, and, and he'd, you know, hop on a fighter plane or a prop-driven plane or whatever and get to fly it around. And, you know, wow, what could be cooler than that, right? Test pilot school. Well, you know, what happens to that job and every other job that I know about is that they eventually wrap work around it. They wrap these requirements. And um, in the case of test pilot school, which is the more entertaining topic, now, what they would do is they would, um, they would ask him to go into the sky and then you know, create some very specific stall type you know, problem that the plane has so that when he builds flight simulators, he can you know, accurately simulate what happens when you do this or that to a plane. In the case of computer programming, it was you know, just not writing things that I wanted to write all the time, but instead writing things that met customer requirements or boss requirements or you know, implement ideas that in my heart I found to be stupid or ugly or, or whatever. But that is the nature of working for somebody else. That's, that's the deal. So what do you do with this all job sucks philosophy? Well, you get the best job you can. That's the deal. Um, all jobs suck, but there's a, there's a delay on, on how long it takes you to figure that out. I remember, shucks, I probably talked to my dad about this five years ago. And I was like, Dad, you know, I just don't love work anymore. And I've got it. I hope that they don't take this the wrong way if they somehow see it at work. But it was like, you know, it, it's not the same passion that it once was. I... Uh, you know, I like my job. It's comfortable. They treat me well. I have no complaints about my employer. But, you know, it, it's it's not this all-consuming, all-day, all-night passion. And my father said, oh, it took you 10 years to figure that out? Then you're doing fine. He says, you should try being an attorney. You know, they figure that out within the first two weeks. And it really resonated with me because I used to be an accountant. That was my first career. And, it, and in two weeks, I discovered that I didn't want to be an accountant. It was dreadful for me. You know, I, I got to the point, and I think we talked about this on Painkiller already once, where you know, I would be driving to work thinking to myself, you know, if I crash this car, I'd get like three weeks off work, you know, and, and like it wouldn't just be lazy either. They'd be like, oh, he's hurt. He can't work. I would get time off if I crash this car. And, and I figured out that I'd rather 
be broken, then get to that job. And that's when I, um, I picked up a second career in, in working with computers. So, so here you are, you have this new job and you're finding that you don't have any passion for it. The thing is, it's not getting any better. My advice to you would be to figure out what you want to do, whether that be your old job, a new job, something else, and work to make that happen. It might be picking up a new de new college degree like I did. It might be, I don't know, picking up some new skill set, networking, who knows. But find something that you want to do for the next 10, 15 years. And, and you have to be so good at it that people are lining up to pay you, I don't know, seventy, hundred and fifty thousand dollars $150,000 a year, whatever it is that you target. And uh, I know you're in the UK, so that, I'm sorry about the numbers. But um, uh, yeah, find something that you can do that you can be awesome at it, that lots of people would compete to pay you for and and make that happen make that your job so you know yeah you know do I think you should stay at this job you don't really love because it's paying the bills no is the economy bad yeah but I don't care you know, there's gonna be opportunities out there and it's no reason for you to you know sit back on your butt and just hope for the best so so there it is uh, oh by the way I appreciate the rare uh, adult problem type message um, I get tons and tons and tons of like you know 14 to 16 year old guys asking for girl advice but uh, you know what to do with your career is something new so I appreciate that anyway uh, yeah go find a way to make your dream job happen for you that's my advice and uh, and if you're lucky it will take you 10 to 15 years before you figure out that you know even working as a pro hockey player is still work because they wrap everything around that you know what they want you to be Hey Woody, I'm a 14 year old boy and I think I have cancer. Some weird stuff is going on with my body and I found something but I don't know for sure. I'm afraid to tell my parents or do anything about it because it will ruin my life. I'm about to go into high school and I don't want to be the kid with cancer. I want to go after girls and I want to be able to mess around with friends without freaking them out and make it worse. I think it's breast cancer and I'm a boy. Woody, I need help and I'm scared. Please help me. All right, I'll start off by saying I'm a little nervous about taking this question because being a YouTube commentator is in no way making me qualified to give out medical advice. But um, <laughs> here's the deal. Cancer is pretty common in women who are above 50 years old. If you get it in your 20s or 30s, you're considered young. About 1% of breast cancer cases happen with guys. So being a 13-year-old boy with breast cancer, your chances are just about zero. All right. What does happen to 13-year-old boys a lot is that, um, you know, because you have these hormones surging through your bodies, you're going through puberty, you're um, uh, sometimes, something, I've, I've looked up, I looked into this, something like 70% of boys get some sort of like little breast development uh, during puberty. So that is most likely what you have here. Now, let's talk about talking to your parents about you know, things that are wrong with you. If you think you have cancer, you don't bury this. If you think that you're sick, you don't keep this a secret. This is all wrong. I get that you're 14 years old, and especially something like breast cancer might be a sensitive topic for you. But um, this is no time to not tell your parents. It's a hope that it will go away. Like if you if you legitimately thought that you had this, then uh, then you need to see a doctor. You need to get some help. Now, oh man, you know I, I hate to act like you don't and like I'm some sort of doctor. I've almost told you that you're in the clear, and I, I wish I hadn't. But um, uh, you know everybody gets sick. Uh, in a case like this, like you're going through puberty, which, which can be like a semi embarrassing sort of thing. But dude, there are tons of semi-embarrassing sort of things that every human goes through, and uh, and you know you don't need to be about it, embarrassed about it for that reason. You know, it, 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 we all go to the bathroom, we all have gas, we all go through puberty. We all, you know, these are just like normal human experiences that uh, that you don't need to be embarrassed about. Other people will not think less of you for having gone through them because they know they've gone through it themselves. So uh, back on topic. I think you should tell your parents. I think you should tell your mom and let her or, or your father, you know, whoever, um, and let them make the decision on whether or not you should be seeing a, uh, a doctor on this. But then again, you can know that uh, when you tell them, the likely outcome is that you're going to be okay. You're going to have a normal high school experience and everything's all right. But, uh, but definitely let somebody more qualified than me help you with that. Hey, Woody, I'm 18 and I'm socially awkward. I've been scared of relationships because of the fact 
I'm just scared of rejection in dating. I've been worried about getting my feelings hurt entirely. Could people give me words of encouragement in terms of dating? I've wanted a girlfriend, but I've been scared about my feelings of being too open and getting hurt. If your subs could help out, I would appreciate it too. I was thinking back to my Road to Woody's Wife series where that <laughs> in this one summer when I worked on the beach, I picked up like sometimes a couple girls a day, definitely a bunch of girls every week. Uh, I had dates almost every night and um, what I did was volume. I was in this easy position where the girls kind of disappeared after um, you know every week, so I didn't really care about my reputation. Anyway, um, it was all about volume. It wasn't any kind of special thing. I would just ask them how long they were staying strike up, strike up a conversation and uh, and rock with it. I was listening to White Boy's video on how he lost his virginity. And it was pretty much the same tactic, except he used MySpace. He would go on MySpace and he would start talking to girls, chat them up, get to know them, etc. And uh, he, for him, it was volume. He's like, he didn't really care if he got rejected. He, if he succeeded once every 15 times or so, he was fine. And that's my advice to you. I, I, I don't think that you should have your entire sense of self-worth wrapped up into whether one girl likes you back or not. Instead, spread yourself out there. Don't worry about rejection. It's a natural part of this dating process. Nobody gets through the whole thing with their dignity intact. Something is going to happen along the way that isn't what you want that's all right it's not a problem uh, instead go put yourself out there talk to lots of girls find one that will like you back and then you'll be set you don't have to have a hundred percent batting average on this thing all you need to do is get a hit so uh, good luck out there and now two videos you may have missed actually both really good ones uh, if if that doesn't sound too arrogant. <laughs> On the left, we have Dissecting Mark of J. So I do this dissecting series. That There's a playlist that, I, that is at the end of it called Dissecting the Greats. Um, I looked at Mark of J recently. I've also looked at Hutch. I've looked at Only Use Me Blade. I've looked at Sandy Ravage. I've looked at some of the best players on YouTube and, uh, and break down what makes them so successful. So if you'd like to see that, click on the link on the left. On the right is Optic Woody. I pull out a sniper rifle, do a little work with it, and talk about some of the changes that Treyarch has made to snipers over the course of Black Ops. It's really maybe different than you think. So um, um, anyway, it, <laughs> enjoy the games, and I hope that you pick one of those to watch.